Anyway, um, it is a real pleasure here today. As Sean said, I'm Sean Conway. I'm a Well County Commissioner, and I represent Well County on the uh, Hooter Heritage Alliance. And, uh, you know, I would like, we have a lot of our board members here, and Kathleen's here, our, our director. Would all the board members of the Hooter Heritage Alliance, I, I don't want to I don't have time to introduce you individually, but I want you to be recognized. Please stand up. I know I think there are eight or nine here today. Or pass. Thank you, Jordan. Pa or if you have served in the past, please stand up. You know, these folks have given uh, blood, sweat, and toil over many decades. And, um, you know, I've been asked to speak uh, about the Cache Laputa River National Heritage Area. Um, it is one of only three in the state of Colorado and 49 nationally. Uh, the Poudre River National Heritage Area extends 45 miles from the Roosevelt National Forest boundary to just east of Greeley at the confluence of the South Platte and the Poudre. Um, it has been a national heritage area since 2009 when a 13-year, can you believe that, Hank, when, and I'm going to talk about you in a second, when a 13-year dispute between the federal government and the state government about how this would be managed and, and uh, done ended, and uh, uh, the folks that both past and present have been working hard ever since uh, in, in terms of that. Um, you know, it's a double pleasure here today to be here as you honor uh, former Senator Hank Brown. And beforehand, I talked to Hank about, and he remembers this fondly, in the fall of 1996. Senator Brown uh, had uh, decided not to continue to serve in the United States Senate, but he had one last piece of legislation he wanted to get done. And there was a little senator, I won't mention that other senator, Hank, who was causing us some problems, some consternation on getting his legislation, the Cash Laputa River Quarter Act, Senate Bill 342, which eventually became Public Law 104-322. I watched as a young staffer for then Congressman Wayne Allard in the, in the, uh, in the cloakroom. Uh, Hank, uh, uh, Wayne was going to succeed. Uh, Hank in the United States Senate. He had sponsored the House version of the bill. And we waited patiently. And I will tell you, the commitment of this gentleman was unparalleled. He presided over the United States Senate in quorum for hours, I think it was, if I remember. And that was the last piece of legislation that was passed in that session. And he made sure. Today, we have a Poudre Heritage Area because of the dedicated work of Senator Hank Brown. Let's give him another big round of applause. You know, as uh, the lead sponsor of the Poudre uh, River Forum, the Poudre River National Heritage Area is proud to introduce um, Justice Gregory Hobbs. Um, many of you know who he is. Before I introduce him, I would be remiss. We have a booth back there. We have a number of items. Um, I really encourage you to pick up some of this information. It gives you detailed information over the history of the corridor, what's going on, what the Poudre Heritage Alliance is working on. And I really encourage you, we have a limited number of supplies of the guidebook. Now, it says 2011, but, you know, we, we, we're cheap, Hank. Uh, we make sure we distribute all of that stuff before we order new stuff. But I really encourage you to visit the booth in the back. Jordan, raise your hand. I think he's manning the booth. He takes care of, takes care of us. And um, if you have any questions or any interest on it, um, this is truly a jewel of northern Colorado. A lot of effort has gone into making this one of only three national heritage areas in Colorado and one of only 49 in the United States. So without ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a true friend of northern Colorado of uh, someone who I have looked up to for 30 years. Justice Hobbs won't remember this, but I remember it like it was yesterday. In 1989, the, I was working for then Senator Bill Armstrong. And then Senator Worth and Senator Armstrong put together what we called a wilderness working group. Remember that, Justice Hobbs? We gathered down on 16th Street in the Senator's office. Never met Greg Hobbs. Heard about him, heard he was a really good water attorney. 
As a young staffer working for a United States Senator, I watched in awe as the negotiations surrounding what eventually would become the 1991 Wilderness Bill, which Senator Brown and Senator Worth accomplished, navigated the very difficult issues of reserved water rights, how we handle BLM wilderness areas versus Forest Service. I watched in awe, and I will always remember that, Justice. Uh, the, he brought clarity to very difficult circumstances. You can imagine we had everybody from the Farm Bureau to the Wilderness Society differing views in terms of how to proceed and what land should be included. And he always brought clarity to the issue. So many of you in this room know Justice Hobbs. He almost comes without uh, a need of an introduction, but I will do that. Justice Gregory Hobbs currently is serving as a senior water judge for Colorado Courts. He is assigned to mediation of water cases. Lucky you if you get him out there if you're a water attorney. You know, um, <clears throat> Greg Hobbs um, was a justice for the Supreme Court from May 1, 1996 to August 31st, 2015. He was a senior water judge uh, for the Colorado Courts um, from January. He has been a senior water judge, as I mentioned for the Colorado Water Courts uh, since January 1 of 2016 to present. Prior to joining the Colorado Supreme Court, he was the partner uh, in Hobbs, Trout, and Rayleigh from 1992 to 1996. Previous to that, he was a partner in Davis, Graham, and Stubbs in Denver at, from 1979 to 1992. And he also served as an assistant attorney general for the state of Colorado for natural resources from 1975 to 1990. Seven, uh, 1975 to 1979, I apologize. He's a frequent teacher. He loves to speak to students on water history, culture, uh, paleontology, uh, hydrology, and the law. Um, currently is vice president of the Colorado Foundation for Water Education and chair of their publications committee. And he's a national uh, judicial, he, for the, he's a uh, chair of the water court for the National Judicial College. Um, one of the things that he is, I think, m might surprise people. We all know he is a prolific writer. He is, uh, is your new book done yet? All right. With, up at UNC, correct? Go Bears. Um, and, um, but he's also a poet. He is a member of the Colorado Authors League, author uh, in praise of Fair Colorado, he, uh, the practice of poetry, history, and judging. Uh, which has uh, uh, been published by uh, Bradford Publishing Company, uh, Colorado Mother of Rivers Water Poems, uh, Colorado Foundation for Water Education in 2005. He's probably more proud of his poetry than his authorship of many, many incredible books. If you have not read a Justice Hobbs book on Colorado water history, Colorado water law, I encourage you to do it. It is well worth your time. So without any further ado, we're here to hear from Justice Hobbs. Please join me in giving a warm welcome for a true friend of the Pooter, Justice Gregory Hobbs. Well, I'm really glad for your invitation and uh, proud to be with you today. You know, I grew up uh, learning from a lot of great people, particularly in Northern Colorado. You know, I served as counsel, assistant counsel and general counsel to the Northern Water District for 17 years. Uh, after uh, being at the Attorney General's office. <clears throat> and I can tell you, it's the towns, the farmers, the businessmen, the uh, people of Northern Colorado that really gave me an understanding, uh, not only the Poudre River, uh, but of this uh, seven county region of Northeastern Colorado, its tremendous uh, heritage. And uh, really uh, to be chosen to be a member of the Colorado Supreme Court and to serve almost 20 years Deciding under a merit selection system, we're removed from politics, judges are, so that we don't have to worry about the political implications of decisions, trying to do the best we could, uh, the seven of us, in some tough times, particularly uh, the drought of 2002-2003. So I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, recognize the great uh, Diane Hoppe and, and Jim Isgar, East Slope, West Slope, that sponsored the Colorado Foundation for Water Education, non-advocacy, non-partisan water education during that uh, horrendous drought. Uh, 
and then to be able to serve on the Poudre Wild and Scenic River Negotiating Committee uh, uh, with Hank Brown keeping us at the table over a number of years and then to uh, watch the Poudre Heritage uh, Corridor legislation emerge while I was still Principal Counsel for the Northern uh, and then transitioned to the uh, Supreme Court in 1996. Uh, now, following um, my retirement uh, as a justice, I was contacted by the city of Greeley uh, to help co-author with Dr. Michael Welsh of the University of Northern Colorado, who will join me after he gets out of his class, uh, to really talk about this seminal western water history that really grows out of this basin. Uh, really, this is a tremendous heritage uh, that came out of conflict and resolution, uh, cooperation, uh, uh, laws that provided stability, yet flexibility to the way we uh, develop and use the public's water resource. So I do want to I do want to start with a poem. Thank you for the introduction, Sean. But I think if you were standing on the the plains in in 1970, excuse me, 1870. Well. You can think about 1970. Uh, how different it would be between 1870 and 1970. Think about that. But you're always looking west of the mountains, and these people that, that settled the Union Colony near the confluence of the Poudre and the Platte, it was a sagebrush uh, cactus-covered plain, but with a beautiful river and lots of potential running through it. So always they looked to the hills, did they not? The mountains, uh, Long's Peak is totally present in front of us. So the poem is, The Way You've Not Yet Been. Lift your eyes to the hills. Plant your feet among the trees. The way that is before you is the way you've not yet been. Gather in your family. Bring along your friends. Raise yourself for each other. Then the mountains will be seen. So the Union Colony was founded as a family town from the start. And the two ditches, the number two and the number three, uh, were essential to the ability to make a life here on the plain. Now, you know, half the population was missing from the mining camps. And these colonists coming from the Midwest and the East to the Union Colony definitely wanted a family town from the start. So the, union, uh, the uh, number three ditch, three-eighths of it were dedicated to lawns, flowers, trees, gardens, right away. And then uh, the rest of the water was for irrigation to grow food uh, and also to then have an agricultural base uh, of commerce. The number two ditch, of course, was to take water up on the bench land and irrigate uh, uh, for uh, growing these crops so, so that people would have a livelihood. So the town and the farm started together, right? You had the bottomland ditches in, in Clear Creek and uh, uh, in Boulder and, and up and down the Platte, the early water rights. But the founding of the original idea of a town was really the Union colonists shortly followed by Fort Collins because in 1872, Camp Collins is surplused, right, from the Army. And we have an, 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 another group of colonists upstream on the Pooter. They build two ditches above the two Greeley ditches. And you know that 1874 problem. Huh? There's the happy irrigators up there, huh? This is June, Harper's Weekly, the journey of, Journal of Civilization. They're very happy. They got water. It's a lush. Uh, they've got food to grow, there's water gurgling through it. August comes, the pooter dries up. Why does it dry up? The new ditches upstream at Fort Collins are taking the entire flow of the river. And of course the Union colonists say, can't you see, we have a town here, we build our ditches, we're depending upon this water. Put the river back. Two years ago, two years later, that blossoms into the Colorado constitutional provisions that set the basis for a rule of law that does several remarkable things originally and foundationally in the West. So I want to go over a little bit about what that Constitutional Convention did in 1876. 
Uh, the Water Committee had two people from Weld County and a number of people from Southern Colorado. Now remember who was in Southern Colorado, the Hispano ditches, the San Luis People's Ditch of 1852, and other ditches had been built down uh, in, in what became uh, part of Colorado when the territory was created in, in 1861. There was an alliance between Northern Colorado and Southern Colorado to write the constitutional provisions. Now, I want to just read to you the first introduced draft. The primary right, right of ownership in the waters of all the streams in this state is and shall be at all times in the state. And said streams and the waters therein are and shall be subject to the control of the legislature. It shall be the duty of the legislature from time to time to pass such laws as may be necessary to secure a just and equitable distribution of the waters. The legislature may pass general laws authorizing the use of water for mining, agriculture, and manufacturing purposes by corporations, associations, or individuals, which laws may be altered or repealed at any time. You get it? The water's owned by the state, the legislature's going to allocate it, and they can repeal how it's done from time to time. That was totally thrown out. <laughs> the draft piece of the Constitutional Convention. What did we end up with? I, I chart this legislative history uh, of the Constitutional Convention because it's, it's so wonderful. But here's what we end up with. The water of every natural stream not heretofore appropriated. The senior Hispanic ditches are going to be recognized. They appropriated earlier. Within the state of Colorado is hereby declared to be the property of the public. And the same is dedicated the use of the people of the state subject to appropriation as here and after provided. And then the water shall be used for beneficial use. That was the primary provision that they put in. So what is the doctrine? The doctrine is water without waste for beneficial use. It's always owned by the public, and you can only develop a use right in the unappropriated waters. These people that went to the convention also saw that putting out, I'll, I'll pick that up. The water that was put on the land, some of it was coming back to the stream. They could see in dry times, you know, August, September, October, the South Platte and the Pooter would go dry in a lot of years. They could see water coming back from the irrigated agricultural ground. So they realized that there were waters being applied to the stream, uh, from the stream to the farms that were coming back, and that would be part of the public's water supply. So they said the waters of the natural stream are owned by the public. The first draft said stream. So we don't have just surface stream. We have the natural stream of the integrated groundwater, tributary groundwater, and service water. This is hugely important because states like Texas, California, and Arizona don't recognize the hydrologic connection, the truth of science itself, the way the waters migrate, that the service stream rides on the back of the tributary groundwater, okay? These people had experience and they had the power of observation. They also had the agricultural college. You know, we, what did Abraham Lincoln run on? Huh? The Homestead Act, the Railroad Act, and the Land Grant College Act. He was the first great Western infrastructure guy. Yeah, those are the foundation pillars of the rule of law. But on top of that is put the constitutional water provisions here, where the greatest resource of all is always owned by the public, subject to beneficial use without waste in integrated tributary groundwater and surface water. Right after that, in, 19, uh, in 1879, uh, uh, the people of Fort Collins and Greeley got together and sponsored adjudication acts that set up water commissioners, irrigation engineers, and the state engineer. Why did they do that? The constitutional provisions were not going to enforce themselves. We had to have honest folks on the stream enforcing the water rights. And the courts were put into the role of adjudicating the water rights, because this is a controversial subject, is it not? As the neutral form. So there you see the three branches of government under the rule of the water law, 
The executive administers the decree of the courts and the legislature from time to time codifies the laws that implement the Constitution. So beneficial use is a broad category. That mention in the original about manufacturing and irrigation and municipal has expanded to include in-stream flow, kayak course rights, slotted into our doctrine of prior appropriation. Who was the sponsor of the in-stream flow law? Fred Anderson of Loveland, Colorado. So, you know, just track the heart of this Pooter Basin uh, as it expands to the rule of law, and then it's taken up by other states. We were the first state to disavow riparian water law entirely. California ends up with riparian and prior appropriation. They've had a heck of a time. Why did we disavow riparian? Because only the owners of land bordering the stream could enjoy the water resource, and then they had to put it back basically undiminished because this is the rule of well-watered climbs, you know, to float boats and, and power, uh, you know, power mills out of mill ponds, uh, power wheels, and return the water back. The people that framed our Constitution were, po were populists. They were agrarians. They didn't want the big moneyed landowners buying up land along the banks of the stream and restricting the use of the water to where it had to be taken. So the original Constitution allows a, a right of way from the stream to the place where water needs to be used. That's how we irrigated the whole of the Front Range and the Western Slope. Uh, out of that doctrine. And so the operation and maintenance of ditches was built into the first territorial law in 1861 to get the water across other public and private lands to where you needed it. So this was a comprehensive view of what the future needed, not only uh, the present. And so we go, the first generation Union colonist descendant is Delph Carpenter. Uh, son of Leroy and Martha Carpenter, who, who settled in the Union Colony early on. Who would have believed it? This is the architect of compacts. He, 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 in, he learns to work uh, the wa uh, waters of the number two and number three. He grows up in Greeley, goes to high school, goes to DU Law School, graduates in 1899. All right. He's a legislator. He's in the Colorado Senate. Uh, his colleagues trust him. His party got voted out. He served four years. They turned to him to defend Colorado against Wyoming, uh, who had filed a uh, suit in the, uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court uh, to have a share of the water that, of the Laramie River. Okay, well, this man had his hands full. He ends up as the architect of what becomes nine interstate compacts sharing the water downstream. And then there are two equitable apportionment decrees of the U.S. Supreme Court because we never could agree with Wyoming and Nebraska over the North Platte and the Laramie. Uh, but by and large, he becomes the great negotiator to share the stream. So prior appropriation is what we administer in the state of Colorado, but he learned by hard uh, arguments in the U.S. Supreme Court, the case was argued twice, in the uh, Wyoming v. Colorado case, uh, that downstream states had developed first if there were two prior appropriation states would get the senior priority. And all of a sudden, Carpenter, who was a great Colorado state's rights guy, said, this can't be. This is not going to work. We've got to share these interstate waters. We're in a federal system. So just think about this. This is the 1841 Wilkes map. Wilkes is uh, is surveying the west coast there, not an inch of which is in U.S. territory, 1841. The uh, Mexican government had claimed that, right? Uh, the vast interior, which is unsurveyed yet, the Colorado River is way out of line, but you have up on the right-hand corner here, the Poudre River. The Poudre River was known. Why was it known? Well, the, the fur trappers, the Native Americans showed them South Pass. That was the low point in the whole of the Continental Divide. You can see the Poudre, the Laramie, the North Platte, and what's called the Colorado River, but it's really the green, a feeder of the Colorado River. But you can see the funnel point here is the Poudre, okay? And the Poudre uh, has been bypassed when the California Gold Rush occurs in, you know, uh, 1848, 1849, you know, they're rushing across the 
uh, to California and Oregon to settle. Uh, and Stephen Long, of course, in 1820, calls this the Great American Desert because he comes up the Platte in August, and there's no water, basically. In the Platte, the snow melt's gone. Great American Desert, right? Uh, so here is the Fremont's three maps, 1842, 1843, and 1845, compiled. He is surveying the route up through South Pass to Oregon and California, uh, which is then used during the gold rush. But the point is that he's coming down surveying North Park, Middle Park, South Park, and he sees the snow melt coming off in 1843, and he writes in his journal, which were actually written up by Jesse Hart Benton, the great literary figure, his wife. He dictated these things. He says, my gosh, this is land that can be irrigated, can be fertile. There is water here, but the water was the snow melt. He saw it happen. So he knew that it could work for a new civilization out here. Now, here's Abraham Lincoln. He's the key guy, right? He's running for platform, on a platform in 1860 in the New Republican Party for homesteading, right? 160 acres are surveyed on, unoccupied by others. If you stayed five years, you get paddled, uh, patent to the surface, uh, but not to the water because the 1866 Mining Act severs the water from the land in the public domain and allows the states and territories to adopt their own water laws. Uh, the Land Grant College Act, the Railroad Act, all right? This is the 1902 land office map, and this is my favorite teaching map, map because this is, this is a pivotal year. 1902, Kansas has sued Colorado for a share of the Arkansas River. But if you look at this map, you will see how Colorado was formed. You got the Ute Indian Reservation of 1868 over there on the West Slope. You see the Spanish land grants that had to be recognized by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and in, uh, in pink there, the Sangre de Cristo Grant, the Bobian Miranda, and the Ville St. Vrain. There are red dots. If you were to look up at Sterling, you'd see a red dot on the map. That's where you went after five years and proved up your claim. You're, you survived. How did you survive? You had to put water on the land, did you not? And it was up to the territorial legislature and the state of Colorado coming onto the Constitution about how you would use the public's water. The original National Forest, Benjamin Harrison, 1891, under authority given by Congress, establishes the first National Forest. The biggest one established at that time was the White River National Forest. That's that big green. It was recognized that the natural forest watershed helped to amplify and provide and even out the water supply for the ditches and the growing communities that are below the forest. Perfect synergy. The farmers and the cities supported the creation of the national forests. This is undeniable. Uh, for a watershed that would be protected against uh, uh, being stripped. Uh, and the new ditches and were being built up there in the forest lands, they would get silted in when the timber was all cut and destroyed. All right? So all you can see here is the formation of Colorado at the time this prior appropriation doctrine is set in to use the water that's coming off the forests. And of course, growing cities came out of the farms. Our first territorial act only mentioned farming as a use. Why didn't mention uh, mining? It's always rumored that mining was the start of the water law. Take a look at Colorado law. Various early territorial law is for farming because the water's coming out off the mountains onto the farmland after it's used basically non-consumptively up there to, uh, uh, to the, do the mining operations, okay? So, so farming was our base. Our cities have grown out of the farms. Our businesses are tied in mostly to the cities. We have a lot of public entities holding water rights to serve water to the public. The farmers are the ones that have the private use rights with the senior priorities because of the way we develop. But our law allows the lease or the sale of the water that was put to the farm. That's part of our doctrine, you know. That's how we've managed the population growth, you know. Reservoirs had to be built, and they were built early to capture the snow melt and to make exchanges with senior ditches downstream, so you would drop reservoir water in, and then you could divert with a junior water right upstream. So a couple of things to get out of this. 
Just leapfrogging up the stream doesn't give you a better right than those people who settled earlier. Return flow comes back to the stream. It's part of the public's water resource subject to appropriation. We integrate groundwater and service water in our system. The courts hear the evidence, make the decrees for applications for conditional water rights, absolute water rights, you put it to beneficial use, change of water rights, or augmentation plans that allow out of priority diversions by replacing the water that seniors are owed. Why were we carved like this? Huh? Well, Kansas becomes a state in the first week of uh, uh, February of, of 1861. Lincoln's been elected. The South is leaving. Kansas doesn't know what to do with this wild mining enterprise that's going on. Colorado Territory is formed out of Wyoming, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Utah territories, huh? To take in the Great Divide as it comes from Wyoming, goes down the Collegiate Peaks, takes that bend around Silverton, comes to Wolf Creek Pass, and goes down into New Mexico, right? Anything that might have the gold and silver. We had to beat back the Confederates at Glorieta Pass, which we did, our volunteers. And what we end up with, of course, is being the mother of rivers because we have the watersheds of the Platte the Arkansas, the Rio Grande, the Colorado River Complex, and that river everybody forgets about because we kind of put our back to the Eastern Plains, the, the Republican. So five major watersheds, 18 downstream states, the Republic of Mexico at the Rio Grande and the Colorado River. We can only consume a third, only consume a third of the water that arises in Colorado because we owe water to downstream states, okay? So we have a very limited budget, what Mother Nature provides us, and uh, uh, minus what we owe across the boundaries on the compacts, okay? The Greeley number three, known as the town ditch. What's built along it? Thank you. <laughs> the Pooter Trail and this heritage corridor. Don't we love to have and do it all? Isn't this essential? The Wild and Scenic River, the National Park, the trail down that joins Fort Collins and Greeley. I like the joining part of this. I mentioned some conflict, but that was early on. I remember well what uh, Senator Brown wanted to do with the Heritage Corridor. And I, I always called it the celebration of the working and the singing river. The heritage of this law that establishes the public's water resource in a way that we can ration Short water, logically, without sh letting newcomers take the water that others depend upon, but allowing the transfer, lease, sale of water rights and conservation is obviously a big part of this. Uh, so here's the Constitution. We used to have it in the Supreme Court Law Library. Had to give it back to the archives. The great Delft Carpenter. Huh? First generation descent became a national statesperson negotiating with all these downstream states to make sure that Colorado had a share for the future. Be why? He was concerned about the Imperial Valley in Los Angeles, that we're getting their acts in place. So now here's the greeley Pooter district that uh, Carpenter represented. He wanted to have water put north and east of Greeley, but uh, and he wanted 100,000 acre feet out of the Laramie River, but the U.S. Supreme Court uh, cut him back to 15,000. Eventually, he knew he was going to lose the case because the Wyoming appropriations had come sooner. So he turned to the statesmanship, this compact idea of sharing the water. So there's the Laramie Pooter Tunnel, was planned on having 100,000 acre feet, ends up with 15,000. Okay, that was the Laramie Riverside. This is the Pooter Riverside. It's still a valuable water supply to northern Colorado, but it's a lot shorter than what Carpenter wanted. Okay, uh, so. Uh, that is the partial flume near the Jackson Ditch. Uh, thank you, Robert Ward, for showing this to me. CSU has always pitched in on stream gauging, measurement, understanding seepage, return flow, developing flumes. Look at that structure <laughs> sitting there in the woods along the Jackson Ditch. Uh, now the Pooter Heritage Corridor which I think is just a marvelous piece of federal legislation, but it's really been done by local communities, hasn't it? Cities, counties, all the rest of you trying to make this dream happen. Come on up here, Michael, because uh, it's now your turn to talk about 
the utility side of this governmental great governance water policy basis that was built out of this Fort Collins Greeley rivalry and then a lot of cooperation. Dr. Michael Wells from the University of Northern Colorado. Well, again, uh, thank you all for um, letting me come in late today. And Hank, uh, I was uh, thinking, uh, Hank was my boss for four years at UNC, and we were never late when Hank uh, came to uh, see us. So uh, <laughs> was always wise to be ready. So I hope I'm ready for you. Uh, again, I really appreciate the chance to speak with Greg. We've been doing this a couple years now, going out and giving these talks in a variety of places. Uh, also, we've been reaching to a variety of audiences, and that was always the charge from the city, was to figure out when we go to put together the story of uh, serving the public with water, we need to make sure the public understands that we understand the public. And so it's great to be able to try these ideas out on you for about 10 minutes to uh, shrink a, to a book down to a few pages or have a few slides here to work. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, we certainly will benefit from any questions or comments that you will have later because we think, we think that the uh, Greeley story is important. Uh, I like to think about it uh, because I'm a rate payer. I learned the word rate payer in working with uh, the city. Uh, that is what I am. And so I guess I'm double dipping. I am paying for the study. I am doing the study. I'm drink I had a drink of water at the university before I left, so I think I have some bona fides uh, in all of this. Very quickly, I also would like to say something about uh, the journey that we've taken to understand the story and uh, how we're going to try to represent it to the reader, uh, to the audiences that are going to be out there a year or two from now. Um, the story of Greeley Water, as Greg has uh, laid out so well, uh, is uh, a, a large one. It's a profound one, and um, it's also a, a challenging one, trying to make sense of all the things that happened, because the people that came here with the Union Colony did, it, did not set out, I believe, to have uh, Greg and I stand here one day and talk about them. I think they came. <laughs> so that those who came after them would figure out what they wanted. You know, they set, the, they set the tone, and it was for the rest of us in each generation to figure out what we wanted that to be. And so I decided that that might be the quickest way in 10 minutes to explain to you how uh, I'm organizing the story of the second part, the second uh, dimension of the water story, and that is the consumer in the communities because, uh, as you all know, it is urban water that rarely gets studied. It's almost always rural water. It's almost always irrigation. And, of course, uh, Delft Carpenters made his name with irrigation systems and reservoirs and things like that. But I think that's one of the things that informed the study of this book was that Greeley water was a function of urban and rural life because that's what the Greeley Union Colony was. They were people that came out here who wanted to have urban amenities, and they wanted to do it with an agricultural economy. Uh, and we think that that continues today. Uh, Hank would know better than us that weave of urban, agricultural, industrial, uh, community, and economics and investment and so on. So they came out looking for irrigation. They wound up with this 1882 map. What they did, as Greg has said, is that they wanted to include urban water in their use pattern rather than just have it separate. So many other communities, you read the history of Denver water. Denver water was not set up to have any irrigation schemes uh, with it. Uh, Denver water was set up for urban users. Uh, what happened here, though, was that they found this river, the Poudre, was great for farming, growing potatoes, uh, growing sugar beets, uh, melons, or anything else they wanted to grow. And it was also good for growing things in town. And so what you've got in that map is you've got these little town plots. Everybody got a lot. They could have anywhere from, uh, uh, you know, eight acres up, or two acres up to 80 acres. Second thing they did is they built trees all around them so that they delineated their space. And as a consequence, uh, the water that was good for their plants, the water that was good for their animals, was good for themselves as well. And so the abundance, the cleanliness, the security, and the taste all mattered to those people when they first settled, and it's been a selling point ever since. Are we right forward? Right forward? Okay. So what happened to the Union Colony, as Greg has said, is that they built a ditch to bring the water into town. And now that they're not the only community. Uh, Fort Collins ran water into town. Uh, Denver had water flowing down its side streets. But Greeley also had these tap lines running in. Before they had tap lines in a pipe, they had little ditches running off the side. And we met uh, uh, Dick Stenzel, who talked to us about uh, the little windmills that you could buy. And you could set it on the edge of your property. And you could turn this little windmill and it had a little bucket. And it dumped in a certain amount of water. 
uh, that that was your allocation. I guess that was the first metering of water in Greeley was having this little windmill. Uh, there's one left. There's one left out in Steamboat uh, in a museum or something like that. Uh, we haven't had a chance to go see it. And so the idea that they brought about wanting to use water for lawns and gardens is in their charter. And they dedicated three-eighths, or 37.5% of the water that came in the flow from the, the number three ditch would be used in town. And that meant use it or lose it. So it was agricultural water. It had to have that same law applied to it that Greg uh, described for us. If you wanted to drink water, as it says here, you had to drill a well. And so water underground, water coming off the river, that's where Greeley gets its abundance. And so here's a picture of the first waterworks plant. And uh, as I wrote in my uh, chapter on the first generation, uh, it was built because Fort Collins uh, built a plant uh, up on the west northwest side of the town. And so we had to have a plant. And we had to have smokestacks higher than Fort Collins' smokestacks. We had to have a bigger boiler than uh, they had. Uh, it was interesting to study that. We uh, figured out, we brought in the Denver uh, Water uh, Union Water Company's chief engineer, Charles Allen, and he brought his latest uh, technology. We wanted only the best for our people. And by the way, that uh, was right down here at 14th and A. Came up 14th, and it's, we're at D, 14th and D, was three blocks away from where we are now. The second generation that came out to um, uh, Colorado and to Greeley, or grew up here, uh, Delph Carpenter, grew up, but there were also others were coming among them. It's interesting the statistical analysis that we have come across. Greeley was not growing by 1900. There were only 3,000 people. There were 1,000 after the first year, 1871. There were only 3,000 left. Denver had become 135,000 on its way to the Denver that we know and love today. My students are always fascinated to notice that Denver was bigger than L.A. for a while. As uh, people said, uh, you know, once Denver, once L.A. got the highway and it got air conditioning and uh, it got, uh, you know, uh, the Lakers uh, or the Dodgers, uh, <laughs> sky's the limit for uh, L.A. But in 1900, the numbers were different. Yeah, Denver was on the move. And so you had Denver down 50 miles south of you growing and changing and expanding and seeking water, going up in the mountains. And you had a population here that was also aging. That's why Delft Carpenter becomes so important to our story. A new generation has got to take over. They're going to have to step in, and it's their turn to make a difference. And so the decision was made to move beyond food crop growing and start to food production. I've been reading about W.D. Farr's family and their potatoes, and they would marvel at all the potatoes that got put into, uh, uh, you know, onto a uh, flatbed truck and taken to the dump and then sent to, uh, on the railroad. But at some point, you wanted to grow things that you produced so that you had a sort of double value. You made more money. So that's where food production within the city limits starts. And of course, by 1901, that's when Great Western Sugar forms. And Great Western Sugar buys up the Greeley plant. And the idea of the sweet water and the abundant water and the secure water, that becomes part of the very tasty sh uh, liquid sugar that's produced. And that was our plant. And so a problem then developed. I suppose we could look back in history and say we all should have this problem. We needed more water. And so what happened is we looked up above Fort Collins and we said, let's go get a ditch that will give us much more water than we use today. And so the former mayor of Fort Collins, Mr. Wedby, Wedby Street in Fort Collins, he had died. Uh, the, the classic story, the kids didn't want to farm. And so when Greeley came around to buy it, they sold it, really purchased about uh, six or seven uh, thousand, you know, six or seven thousand acre feet. And uh, that ditch is still in use. That's a picture Greg took. That's what the water looks like before it goes into the treatment plant. So you can see why clean, secure, and abundant was a goal. And also, they were also studying the New York model because New York was doing the exact same thing, New York City. And New York was proud of that long distance of piping and uh, facilities up in the mountains to capture the water. And New York had a cliche they called champagne water because obviously New York and Champagne uh, go together. And so since they didn't drink in Greeley, we never called it Champagne water. <laughs> we called it clean, All right? <laughs> it had the same effect though, it tasted good. And uh, I suppose you could uh, go down to Evans and get a chaser, but I will not tell the Evans story in water either. <laughs> You've already done that about fighting with Evans to see who's going to get uh, the, the, uh, the city government, the county government and so on. So then it's time for a third generation. Delph Carpenter is aging out. Uh, the 1930s appear, and there's, of course, the classic picture. What happens when the water's turned off? 
I just was hearing on NPR this morning, is it Cape Town, South Africa? It's got until February 15? April 15? And I'm listening to them, and they're saying, we don't know what to do. There'll be no more water. And so Greeley faced its Cape Town moment long ago, the Plains, the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl. And so the challenge was, can we get water to keep the farm economy going, the food production economy going, and the urban growth that came with all of that production? And so the story that uh, everybody knows is that on that uh, Monday morning after the Supreme Court on the previous Friday, June of 18, 1933, said that uh, Colorado can't have all of the water from Wyoming that flows out of the Laramie Basin into Wyoming. Uh, the it's not apocryphal at all. Uh, Charles Hansen, the publisher of the newspaper, is supposed to have turned to the city of Greeley's lawyer, Tom Nixon, and said, let's go get the feds and let's go over the mountain. And so the Greeley leadership stepped up. They brokered the deals to get started. Charles Hansen gave space down in the basement of the uh, Greeley Tribune, and in came all of these national class uh, engineers and scientists and geologists. It's hard, it's interesting to walk down into the basement today and imagine that uh, Harold Ickes, the Secretary of Interior, walked through there. You know, the Bureau of Reclamation people walked through there because, as Brian Werner has taught us very well, there's what you got. Out of that conversation in the post office downtown came Colorado Big Thompson Project. And I, I stole that from Brian's shop. You know, that's you, that's your distribution of water. All right. The 310,000 acre feet that was to be distributed, obviously about 250, 260,000 gets distributed today. What fascinated me in the reading of this is when, just like with Delph Carpenter making sure that the Colorado Compact allowed for Colorado to have a share beyond perhaps what it was using at the moment, really said we need 15,000 shares, not acre feet, shares of that water for us. That changed the character of Greeley. If the Colorado Big Thompson changed the character of northern Colorado and Denver and everything else, Greeley's going to be different with that volume of water. So securing that flow from the Colorado River right, brought all that growth to the Front Range. And so cities now own, is it right, Brian, two-thirds? Is it two-thirds the multiplier? Started out as 85% and has become two-thirds along the journey. And so the next generation is when... Hank started out working with the, you know, the uh, sugar or with the uh, meat plant. Uh, what was happening was Denver was changing to an urban industrial uh, community, less uh, crop production in between. Northern Colorado started making that shift. Greeley continued to produce food because somebody's got to eat, and we could do it well, and we had the water, and we started finding other ways, just like we had done with potatoes, just like we had done with meat. The Montfort meat plant in the 1960s. Uh, will be built uh, right next to the river. I believe, I think it was 23 wells. It wasn't just pipes coming in from irrigation ditches in the city. You had your own water underneath. It was an amazing amount of water. I was not aware, uh, I've only been here since 1990, I was not aware that Great Western Sugar in 10 years, Montford Beef in 10 years became a Fortune 500 company. In 10 years. It was a stunning story all right, that we want to talk about. But that's also because Greeley's people kept going out and trying to find new water beyond this story. Greeley's people developed the idea of the lease back, Greg has uh, talked about, the idea of you can't use, you know, you want to stay on your land, we can't use it now, one day we'll need it, maybe you won't. So the idea of the lease back comes about W.D. Farr and his generation of that. But then also within that generation came the pressure to uh, clean the water came the pressure to preserve the water, to conserve. All of those issues uh, about in-stream uses that you have been talking about today really had to engage all of those questions. And so what happens today? Where are we now and where will Greeley go after the fifth generation passes through? Right? We're at another demographic crossroad, just like we've been in 1900 and in 1930 and in 1960 and in 1990. We all know the numbers. Now, I read my Denver Post, and I think they're trying to, you know, hedge their bets. They used to say 10 million. Now they're saying 8.5 million by uh, 2040, 2050. Uh, it's going to be 5 million or 3.5 million in Denver. Uh, as my students say, when they can't get to class on time at 8 because they thought they could get out of bed at 6.30, get on the road at 7 in Denver and be in class at 8, they all say there's too many cars, too many cars in Denver. And I say, well, you know, was it easy once you got out of Denver? I said, no, you guys got too many cars too. 
So we're all going to be asking the question, where do we live? How do we live? And so Northern Colorado, is it going to be 2 million people? Is it going to be a quarter, uh, 240,000, um, you know, going to be in the Denver area? And uh, so Harold and the board have been trying to figure out the math, how to make that happen. And how are they going to make all that happen if we can't make the water double? How is it done? Well, it's the same logic. You would have to go back and ask the Union colonists, how'd you do it in your day? Is the answer now this mix of conservation as well as purchases? Is it also this mix of urban development becoming more dense even as we grow out? Is it the new generation that's going to use water less than perhaps earlier generations did? I put up the picture there to finish us today of the uh, big sports facility that's going to be built out in a field outside of Windsor. Uh, and I was fascinated reading the specifications on it. And they're making sure to put up front how little water they're going to use, even though they want to have so many people, so many ball fields, so many hotel rooms. They're talking up front. We can make it happen with less water than you should. And so I asked my son, who's uh, now you know, working in the master's program at CSU, I said, so what do you think your generation wants? And he said, Dad, we all want to walk downtown and we want to live in an apartment and we all want to have less water. That's what we want to be. So the question for us is, will we be ready for the sixth generation coming when they say, thank you for protecting this water. Thank you for preserving it. Will they say of the Union Colony, thank you for wanting it to be clean and tasteful? Does that make sense in the idea of preserving and making sure that it's useful? We'll find out because they'll turn and look at us and they'll say what was often said. And either that is, thank you, or what were you thinking? Thank you. This is for Justice Hobbs. The definition of waste, how has that changed through time and how do you see that evolving into the future? Okay, uh, waste would be wasting, uh, taking water that you do not need. Uh, and our doctrine is beneficial use. So you can only divert at any given time under our law what you need and is in priority in your water right. Otherwise, the next junior is entitled to it. The return flows are not waste. They're going back into the tributary groundwater or their surface water, right? So they're part of the public's uh, water resource. So uh, beneficial use without waste is the standard for changes of water rights. So a change of water right is not granted unless the historic consumptive use is measured over good years, average years, and dry years. That co total consumption is, in effect, the burdens on, on the public's water resource, that which, which was beneficially used, can be changed, sold, leased, subject to making sure that all the other priorities are protected. So, so waste is boiled out at the change of water right. If you want to change it from irrigation to municipal, and these municipalities that are doing this, uh, are, are well used to this, you know, you engineer the fact that you've got to determine what the crop was actually using and consuming that wasn't available to other water rights. So without waste means you don't reward wasteful practices. You only reward beneficial use, okay? But make no mistake, seepage under unlined ditches, return flows from fields is not waste. It's part of the public's water resource. Does that help? Any evolution uh, in the future that's different from what we have now? I see, uh, just as uh, uh, Professor Welsh said, that municipalities are going to look a lot to conservation, and that's in the water plan, to uh, help uh, reduce demand. And so urban conservation is extremely important. We're seeing more efficient uh, agricultural uh, uses as well. But you got to remember, if you enlarge your beneficial consumptive use, you know, you, you are taking water away from somebody else. So there's always this issue between what is efficient use and what is use that is enlarging your water right out of somebody else's pocket. So I think what we have here is a, a blend of, uh, uh, you know, utilities have to pay the way now, right? We have all these public entities, ratepayers and so on, who are going to be sensitive to, to uh, 
rate increases but need to be convinced that the water is being conserved and it's being beneficially used. So I see the seeds of the doctrine playing out more and more as the population increases and we have to use the same amount of water that was available to the Mesa Verdeans, <laughs> you know? <laughs> huh? Except that we're, we're going to have to manage it a lot better and we have to manage the snow melt. And that's why we store it or recharge it into the aquifers. Any other questions? The Union Colony people, as we have uh, written so far, believe that you had to understand where you were and what you wanted and what it took to get there. We think that the Union colonists also designed a system of water delivery between this mix of well water and uh, surface water, uh, which has continued on the search for the water up in the mountains. You, you know you need more. I think the third thing the Union colonists would tell us, and that is, if a new generation finds another reason for using it, and it's their turn, they need to approach it in the same direction, and that's where I hope we have trained the next generation well. And so I think that's what, the Union Colony was big on education. The Union Colony was big on, on learning. Adelph Carpenter was taught well, you know, in college. He was taught well by lawyers in town and so on. So I think that uh, all of those issues that were strong in the roots of the colony uh, will be something we'll have to turn to today. Uh, otherwise, we're, you know, we're just going to be asking ourselves what's next. I don't think the Union Colony would want us to do that. Let's thank them once again. Thank you.